You know, I've told again and again that story in my work about how Graham Greene, the novelist, played Russian roulette with a revolver he found in a cupboard and how he usually was a um, pessimistic sort of schoolboy. When he pointed this gun at his head, spun the chambers and then pulled the trigger mm. and then he heard just a kick and realized he hadn't blown out his brains. Mm. He experienced an overwhelming feeling of sheer happiness and delight, a feeling that's far more powerful than any normal feeling we experience. Now, this is what we're talking about. It's actually a shock, a real shock of recognition. And so, to say that we're living in a world that gives lots of justification for misery, mm. um, you know, it, it misses the point. Because, in a sense, you could say that if you'd looked back 200 years even, you were living in a world with far more misery in it, far more poverty and starvation, and, you know, children being forced to go to work at the age of 10, and so on. So, in fact, we are living in a world in which everything, in a way, is quite wonderful compared to in those days. Mm. All we have to do is simply learn to grasp this. <laughs> so, the... Um it isn't as bad as we might think it is in one way and 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 but the trick there is to to stay in that uh, in that mo in that mindset i i think as well and of of being positive and would you say that that is about disconnecting from the world maybe even connecting with the idea of of the outsider overall that you've obviously written about that we need to live our own lives and not the lives of of everybody else or whatever is happening in the world because ultimately that doesn't concern us so to speak well you see when um, I was in my teens and I first began to think about the idea of the outsider, about the outsiders I admired particularly, like, say, you know, Van Gogh um, or um, Beethoven or Nijinsky, I had this feeling that I had discovered one of the most insp important subjects in the whole world and that if I clung on to this, then, you know, nothing else would matter too much. I, I had a feeling almost of a kind of religious revelation. Mm. And, of course, it just so happened that at about this time, I also stumbled upon the Bhagavad Gita, the sort of Hindu scripture, mm. and began doing a great deal of meditation and that kind of thing. Well, I think that once you've got used to this idea of making a certain effort, a certain kind of spiritual effort, you've already made um, the greatest commitment you could possibly make. Um, you see, when I wrote The Outsider, the last lines of The Outsider was that when a person begins this long path, they begin it as an outsider, but he may end it as a saint. And I've always been preoccupied with this idea. It ought to be possible um, to be a saint, to become a saint, simply by logic, by understanding the logic of this human existence that we lead. Mm -hmm. Most people's logic is so vague. They, their reaction to problems is so immediate that they simply have to learn to use their rationality yeah. far more. Yeah. So this is the reason that I've always been, in a way, a, a highly rational sort of person. Mm. We can uh, we can use obviously our 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 brain and our our mind to that advantage that we can go about problem solving and and maybe this is applicable to what we talked about earlier in terms of the state of the world as well that we have to. Uh, think and as, as you said, Colin, compare to how things were 200 or even 500 years ago, and, and and see that we're in a better position maybe now than we were then. Not only that, but I think that uh, we, you can actually, once you approach a problem with a certain kind of drive and optimism, the problem tends to solve itself almost as if 
some invisible force is helping us. <laughs> You, you said earlier as well in terms of the how the the robot takes over this the basically our subconscious uh, mind and I was interesting enough reading in an, an article yesterday about how thought creates reality as well and it was yeah. talking about this aspect of how for instance when people uh, drive or or other things like this uh, we actually end up in a kind of a trance a hypnotic state where That's the right, yeah. subconscious takes over and this article actually argued that. This was a good thing in, in this case, because if our conscious mind would have been driving, there would be a lot more accidents on the road because people would panic and things like that. Uh, oh, sure. And, and, and so in that sense, it seems like in certain instances, this is a, this is a good thing, obviously, that, that we have this uh, ability to kind of hand things over, if you will, to the subconscious mind. To the mind. robot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the robot is obviously tremendously useful, but we have to learn um, how to get things back from the robot. Now, when you're young, um, this is not all that difficult because, fortunately, most young people have a fairly strong sexual urge. And so, you know, if they're interested in a person of the opposite sex, it tends to be fairly easy to suddenly experience this sense of, my God, isn't the world wonderful? Mm. Um, as you get older, this gets slightly more difficult, I find. I mean, I'm now nearly 79. Mm. I should be 79 in a week's time. In about a week, yeah. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, what I'm hoping is that, you know, I personally would have no reason, as far as I can see, um, why my mind should not continue in the way that it is at the moment. In other words, fairly awake, fairly alive, um, subject to lots of new ideas. To be honest, the only problem with me at my age is I find your legs get less good mm. and it's more difficult to go on long walks, yeah. more painful. How, if, if we talk a little bit about um, this idea, if we go back to the occult again, a big aspect of your, of your work, and I, I remember watching a, a documentary about Alistair Crowley, that's a few years ago now, but I rewatched it recently. Uh, it's yeah. called The Other Loch Ness Monster. You might remember that, uh, obviously, you were, you were in that. And this was about mm. Crowley's time at uh, Boleskine House in, in Scotland. And and you were generally talking about magic and, and, and the occult. And, and this comment stuck with me that you mentioned that, uh, basically, that the reason the reason why people are attracted to it or, or the reason why people come back to it is, is because it actually works. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a potent force and, and it's it's a it's true in that sense and i wonder if you maybe can talk a little bit more about that in terms of both the magic and the occult if you make any differences between those two terms and also uh what it is that you why does it work if i can put it that way how come these things do, do work indeed well crowley thought that magic was discovering your true will in other words that magic was something to do with what you might call the real you. Um, again, to go back to this notion of the robot, William Blake, the poet, once said, each man is in his specter's power until the arrival of that hour when his humanity awakes and casts his specter into the lake. And what he's saying is that once something inside you wakes up, there is an extraordinary force which we human beings are quite capable of exerting and which will suddenly lift us to a new level. Now, this is what Crowley meant by magic. And there are quite a few stories. You probably remember the story of somebody asking Crowley to demonstrate to them the power of magic. Mm -hmm. So Crowley began to... They were, they were in London, I think, to walk along the street behind a man who looked like a stockbroker who was carrying a briefcase. Crowley walked behind him and began to imitate his walk exactly and precisely. And then quite suddenly, Crowley broke his stride and collapsed onto the pavement. The man in front of him also collapsed onto the pavement. Hmm. What Crowley had done was in a way broadcast something, but obviously... Um, he simply passed on some impulse in exactly the way that your television control 
passes on a radio impulse and changes the television program. Hmm. 